when I was 11, I got a scholarship to a boarding school. So I, I actually left ENDS at 11. It was weird because I remember one time we went to play a game of rugby and we ended up losing the game, which is very rare for us as a, as a team. Like an argument ensued afterwards. And I remember someone from my team referring to the other team as council estate scum. And them not obviously realizing that I'm from a council estate, I've grown up in a council estate. From a young age, I've kind of had a chip on my shoulder as a result. I've always been like, all right, you viewed me as less than because of my environment, but I can show you that anyone from this environment can achieve what you guys are achieving. You recently announced on Twitter that you hit the million pound mark as a business. I think now that we've done the first meal, it's about trying to replicate that again as quick as possible and continually scale. Today, I'm on my way to meet William Adossi, a British Ghanaian entrepreneur who came from a council estate in South London to generating over 1 million in revenue with his high-end watch brand Vitae. With an infatuation for fashion, in particular jewellery, Adossi applied for a small loan from Virgin Startup in 2016, along with 7K he had previously put aside to help him launch the watch brand. Later on, Adossi went on to be mentored and endorsed by Richard Branson, the iconic English business magnate. I'm here to converse with William Adossi about his entrepreneurial journey, how he's overcome difficult scenarios, and what he envisions Vitae to develop into globally. William Adossi, brother, thank you very much for sitting down with us. It's, I know you're a busy man, whether you're in Africa, in the UK, <laughs> to pin you down and have you down today is like, Incredible. So first of all, thank you very much for taking the time. Um, this is a conversation. This isn't like a, an interview where it's like the right answer, politically right, or mm -hmm. just a conversation. Because I think what you've been doing over the past, I don't even give it a number, but over the past years has been incredible. Um, and to see the journey unfold every day and get larger and larger in its scale, it's like incredible. So first off, commend, I commend you for that. Um, but yeah, so just to kind of kind of get the, the understanding of, of who William is. You grew up in Camberwell. Yes. Tell yes. me how Camberwell, South East London, moulded and shaped William and Dossie. That's a great question. Um, yeah, so I grew up across Camberwell and Peckham. And yeah, back in the day, it's not the area that it is now. Um, back in the day, it was, it was pretty manic, to say the least. And I think it just shaped me in terms of like an acute level of awareness. Like you always had to be watching your surroundings. Um, but an another way it shaped me, I would say, is just, it gave me the value of community. Um, like, yeah, growing up on our on our estate, you're always just around people. Like every single day, someone will come knocking on the door. Nine times out of 10, my mum would say no, but the times I was allowed out, like you're just around people and community was everything. So I think that's one thing I even carry today. Like in everything I build, I try and make community centre. So yeah, it definitely shaped me a lot. Yeah, I mean, Campbell is a very uh, progressive place now, very diverse and somewhat becoming gentrified. Sure. At that time, you know, it's kind of in between Brixton, Peckham. You've got a lot of the, the gang uh, and knife crime that at that time was pretty much mm -hmm. prevalent. How, how did you navigate that environment? It was interesting. I think my parents shielded me a lot. Um, so yeah, my dad's a pastor. I'm the firstborn of seven children. And yeah, my dad was very hard on us in terms of discipline, in terms of studying. So he'd always send us to after school clubs, just keeping us like very occupied to try and ensure we avoided that lifestyle. Um, yeah, and for me, like I, I knew people in that world. Obviously we all grew up with people in that world. Um, but I, I kind of, I was shielded from actually entering it fully or kind of partaking or engaging in that. Um, I could have gone down that route, but for me, it's just, it didn't, it didn't really make sense. And I actually ended up, um, going to a boarding school. So, cause my dad was, I wouldn't say scared of the area, but he was aware of everything. Um, he, he pushed hard on me to do like after school studies, as I said. And then when I was 11, I got a scholarship to a boarding school. So I, I actually left ENDS at 11. Um, I was all the way in the Midlands, coming coming back to London most some weekends and then for holidays. 
So that was just a big eye opener as well to see like that there's a different world out there. Um, you grow up in the in your area and you think that's everything. You think that's the only life that can be lived. And then I go to this boarding school and I see the cars that people's parents are picking up, picking them up in. I remember being like, as I said, one of seven children. We were in this two bedroom like council estate flat. And then I go to boarding school. I go to my friend's house. It's just him and his sister, and they're in this like seven bed mansion. And I just, it's like it was just such a massive eye opener to a world beyond the world that I'd lived in. Um, so yeah, I think just my parents being super hard on education, it being very disciplined and strict enabled me to kind of navigate what what was a pretty crazy world. And I mean, like you've, I mean, you say 11, but at the, at the age, I'm sure you were getting blips of playing out, being in the playground, yeah, yeah. building somewhat of a friend group. Yeah. And obviously you have an innate relationship with your family. And then you go from that to like, moving yep. outside of that how did you interpret that transition of like actually like leaving family and leaving everything that you yeah. know it was weird it was like yeah I, I felt like a big man at 11 do you know what I mean like I've left my house um I'm in this own I'm in my own environment kind of fending for myself and I think it taught me a lot of skills and again as I said it's just en enabled me to shape my mindset around what is possible so yeah, at first I was just excited to be away from home. I think anyone at the age of 11 would get gassed that I don't, ha I don't have to be under my parents' ruling um, for a season. So yeah, I just remember initially being super excited, then going there and just being like, whoa, this is different. And kind of being like shocked a bit and hit, hit, hit a bit back by that. But then I've, I've always been like a competitive person. So when I entered that environment, I just wanted to compete. I wanted to compete in terms of when it came to education, but not so much the education. I should have been more serious with that, but I saw my competitive nature come out a lot in sports and, and other arenas. And just, yeah, being in that environment away from my family for me was just, yeah, it enabled me to kind of grow into myself um, and fend for myself. And I ended up having to grow up probably quicker than I, than I would have if I was back home. How were you received in that environment? It was interesting. I, I would say for the most part, received fine. It was it was cool. But it, it was weird because I remember one time we went to play a game of rugby. So we've gone to play this local school in a game and we ended up losing the game, which is very rare for us as a, as a team. And then like an argument ensued afterwards. And I remember someone from my team referring to the other team as council estate scum. And them not obviously realizing that I'm from a council estate, I've grown up in a council estate. So you hear all those like subtle nuances and yeah, it's, 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 it's very interesting. But I think from a young age, I've kind of had a chip on my shoulder as a result because I'm, I've always been like, all right, you viewed me as less than because of my environment, but I can show you that anyone from this environment can achieve what you guys are achieving. I've been in the school with you guys and I've competed with you on on every level. So you looking down on me just because of my environment doesn't make sense. So yeah, for me, I think it's definitely put a bit of a chip on my shoulder and pushed me to be driven from a from a very young age. So then you do how long, you, 11 years old, how long is? Yeah, I was there for five years. So from the ages of 11 to 16, um, and then yeah, came back to London, ended up at, at CETA London Academy. City Academy. Yeah. And how was that, that rebirth or that return, should I say, of coming back? You, you hit back to London, yeah. You've been in this environment and back in back in the mix. How was that? I was excited to be back. Um, excited to be around my people. Yeah, I was just I, at, by the time I hit sixteen, I was kind of fed up with boarding school. Um, I was fed up with yeah, just those little like microaggressions and like facing that from a young age. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. So yeah, I was I was happy to be back. Um, and, and and our college was quite small, so that was cool to just network with with people in a in a in a cool environment, and yeah, like being back, it was still quite manic on it in the area that I grew up in. It was still pretty hectic in terms of knife crime was still prevalent, gang culture was still prevalent. So trying to navigate that, understanding everything in a way, networking with the right people, so I knew I was good was was the first thing I did when I got back. But yeah, I, I loved being back. I loved just being around my people.
Was there a change in, in friends that you had left at 11 to when you got back? Did you see any? Yeah, definitely. Um, sadly, some friends went down the wrong path. Um, I've, yeah, in, in varying, varying different degrees. Um, but some, there was a few of my solid friends that st- did well during secondary school, came back and we, we, we were able to connect properly. And again, I was coming back over summer holidays. So I was still, I was still quite close with a lot of them. So yeah, that was, that was eye opening again to just see from 11 to 16, the way people grew up, the routes, dif- the different routes people took and the people, yeah, the way people evolved was very, very interesting. Um, yeah, unfortunately, as I said, some down the wrong path, but a lot of people actually ended up down a pretty good path. So you've taken this like educational route and you've clearly had a lot of investment from your family pushing that as, as the way to go. And as we know, education generally kind of veers more towards working for a company or, or, or an organisation. When do you think the, the idea started to kind of stem for you to, to, to go out your own way? Because I know Vita isn't your first company. When, when did that transition happen? For sure. I think I've always had it in my heart to be an entrepreneur. I don't know where it came from. I, I didn't know, yeah, the root of that desire. But at the age of 19, I'd done uni for a year. I actually dropped out of uni without telling my parents. Um, and I started a sports academy. So I saw all my friends that I'd grown up with, gone to college with, loads of them had done like these FA level one or two qualifications. They had done their CRB checks because they, they'd done some work around it. And I saw a lot of them were sitting idly and they had free time on their hands. Some of them were in university, so they had some free days. Um, so when I spotted that opportunity, I started calling up schools and, and telling them about the amazing talent that I was representing. Um, these these great sports coaches that were passionate about um, young people and wanted to run these after school clubs. So and at the time, the government were giving primary schools funding to kind of help tackle childhood obesity. Um, so I, it was such an easy pitch. I was able to sell in these people I had to these schools, tell them how to secure the funding for this, um, and then yeah, we were running these after school clubs, and I was making a margin on top. So I ran that for about three years. And then unfortunately the government pulled funding and I wasn't sharp enough to pivot. Um, So as a result of that, the business kind of had to close down. I remember being like 22, we'd done six figures. I was so excited, but then I had to literally wind up everything. And I think I learned so much from that season. Uh, We had an office as soon as we could get one And when I look back, there's so many little things we probably didn't need, probably didn't need the office, didn't need to be spending in other arenas, which could have given us a buffer for when something like as big as our funding um, kind of collapsed. Um, So yeah, at at the age of 22, I then actually ended up working in the city as first an insurance broker and then a recruitment consultant. And while I was working in the city, I finished my degree part time um, because my parents are Ghanaian, so I couldn't. Couldn't really get up, get away with not finishing uni. Um, so yeah, I finished that part time. And then in 2016, was frustrated with the world of working full time. And yeah, ended up starting at Vitae London. So just before we go into Vitae, just take me back between you being at a state where you're, you're in uni and then you go, no, this isn't. What, what, what was the, where were you at at that space? Yeah, I, like I was going into uni every day and I would say I just wasn't, motivated in a sense I think so I was studying business but I just wanted to build business like I was just passionate about practically putting into work everything I was learning day to day and I was we were getting just so many schools interested we were interviewing so many new candidates so after just my friends and family finding them roles we ended up placing like job adverts on Gumtree and just inviting random people into interview so that was just taking up so much of my time to the point where I was just like, this uni thing probably just isn't for me right now. So I parked that after year one. Um, and every day I was getting up dressed to go to my office, my parents just assumed I was going to uni. Um, and I was just, yeah, just building the business. So yeah, for me, it was just getting to a point where I just wanted to build business. And I'm a real practical learner. I think I learned through trial and error. I think I learned through just diving in head first. So that was the, that was the only route for me really. 
And you, you talk about like having that first moment where you've built a business and it hits six figures. And most people kind of go over the fact that having a business which makes money and then all of a sudden having to admit that you have to close it, what was that like? What was that period for you like? I don't know. There was a part of it that was a bit of a relief in a sense because obviously once our funding stopped, things started to get tricky with maintaining office bills and, and, and everything. So when we got to a point where things were winding down and I had another business partner in, in the business as well, I think I kind of felt relieved. Um, I, I And if I'm honest, I wasn't ever particularly passionate about running a sports academy. Um, it was just an opportunity I had spotted. Um, so when it was time to close up shop, um, yeah, there was a sense of relief. And also there was a, there was still a sense of accomplishment. Like I realized that we'd achieved some good things, especially for our age. And there's so many things I've learned from that season that I apply to today. Um, so yeah, it was a blessing. At the time, it was, it was probably more awkward. It was difficult navigating every, everything. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy I lived that season for sure. So you, you've have, you have this experience and you then follow the rules mm. and do what parents want. <laughs> and you kind of go back into the, conf, conf, like the structure, should we call it for like? Sure, sure. But somewhere in that, you're like, no, one more. Mm. What, 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 tell me about that and why does that happen? I think, I think some people are naturally geared to entrepreneurship. Um, it, I think it's just an innate nature. So for me, no matter what job I did, no matter who was my manager, my boss, who I was working with, I always felt a level of frustration after a certain amount of time. Um, I think maybe it's just upholding the structures or upholding just being a pawn within those structures for me. It got to a point where it just wasn't working. Um, so yeah, day to day, I, like, I was actually killing it. Like I was, I was one of the top rookies within my company. It was like a FTSE 250 listed company. So out of the whole of Europe, I was one of the like the top billers. Um, there was a point where I was bringing in like eight grand a week for my, in terms of recurring revenue for my business. And I was doing well, but yeah, it just got to a point where I was like, wait a minute, I'm able to generate all this income for these people. Even if I just generated a fraction for myself, at least I would have freedom. Um, and I think freedom is the key for me. I think a lot of people don't know why they want to go into entrepreneurship or maybe understand it. But one of the key levers for me is, is just freedom. Like the freedom, like I'm happy to work hard, but I want to work hard in an environment that suits me. And yeah, I think that was, that was the kind of turning point for me. So then you decide to go into an industry, which I don't know, from what it sounds like, you haven't had experience in per se. Mm. Why, why, going into, why go into initially the watch and, and take that path? Yeah, like, so for me, growing up, I was always fascinated by watches. Like, throughout all my early years, I would um, collect G-Shop watches and Casios. Then in college days, that graduated to these watches called the Aquamasters, which I just loved, collected those. Then I started collecting like your Fossil, your Michael Kors watches. And then I'm in my, yeah, my mid twenties. And it's the point where you need to start upgrading to the flashy watches like what you're in, the, the Rolexes and the, and, the, and the big boy premium watches. And I looked at, I looked at it and I, I was keen to, to get into it. And I, I just felt to myself that at an affordable price point, there just weren't many watches that really caught my attention. Um, I felt like at an affordable price point, like I'm talking the one, two, three hundred pound mark, there was just such a gap for someone to bring something that had a real classy appeal and that had the appeal of the more premium watches, but the masses could afford it. Um, so for me, just yeah, as I said, my fascinating with my, my fascination with watches growing up just evolved into me just spotting an opportunity. Um, yeah, to create some amazing designs, but at a point, a price point that every Tom, Dick and Harry would be able to, to be able to buy one. So that's definitely where it stemmed from. And then it, then it then launches Vitae London. Mm, mm. Tell me about that transition and, and going into that. Yeah, so Vitae launched in, t in 20, January, 2016. Um, and Vitae is actually Latin for life. So our whole 
kind of mantra, our whole ethos is to be the watch brand changing lives. Um, so in essence, whenever we sell a watch, we help support a child for education across sub-Saharan Africa. And yeah, like I always say it was, it was birthed out of like a frustration and a pain point. Frustration in working a job I wasn't passionate about, in knowing I was creative, but not being able to pursue anything creative day to day. And then the second frustration is I was looking at like, I was looking, tracing back and talking to my dad and he's the first in my family line to learn to read and write. And this, this breaks a cycle of poverty that was affecting us for generations. And in doing my research, I realized that Sub-Saharan Africa is the one region in the world where poverty has actually increased in the past 25 years. It's the only region in the world that that's happened. Everywhere else, it's at least subsided or decreased in some way. And that coincides with the fact that it's the region in the world where the least amount of young people are in, in education. Um, so yeah, seeing that as well and thinking about all the wasted potential. Um, if my, if I imagine if my dad did get an education where would I be today or where would we be? And just the power in that. So for me, I knew that the business I built after working in the city had to have a, a positive purpose. It had to have a, a purpose greater than myself. Um, so yeah, in January 2016, I convinced the missus to allow us to invest our house savings. I quit my full-time job and just went all in to, to building this business. With just that, I think I had a bit of a naivety, if I'm going to be honest, around the watch industry. I probably had a bit of a naivety around the competition, but I think sometimes that's best because if you spend so many months and years researching it in depth, you'll kind of um, convince yourself into thinking that you, you can never tackle it. Whereas because I had a bit of that naive, naivety and I, and I ran in um, head first, I was able to, to go after my competition. I was able to build in an industry where a lot of people say it's impossible to kind of carve a new path out. So yeah, that's how it all began. And then, you know, you're going into this market space and you mentioned about being a bit naive. What, what did you find out about it? I found out how fiercely competitive it is. Um, I found out not many people that look like us are in this space. Um, yeah, I just found out how like there are there are quite a few different high barriers to entry to succeed within the space. Sometimes you need a lot of capital to actually build out um, and market effectively. Um, so yeah, that that was a lot of learnings. But for me, if I was aware of all of that before starting, I probably wouldn't have started or I would have gone into a different industry or took myself out of it. So I'm grateful that, yeah, I'm grateful that I faced those challenges after being passionate, after being enthused by the vision, um, so that I could, yeah, I could tackle it with more armor. Um, so yeah, that's that was the, the inception of it all. What was your, I mean, you've always been quite candid with sharing your story in the media. Yeah, yeah. And like you said, there's not many people that come from South East London mm. that invest in their dream and then take it to the world. Mm. A lot of those, moments, of course, fear is a factor. How, how do you actually navigate fear and how have you navigated fear and, and pushed through? It's weird. I'd, I've never been really a fearful person. I've got more of a, like a why not or what's the worst that can happen kind of mindset. So a lot of people have said to me, wow, you invested your house savings, you quit your job, you're so brave. And I'm just like, not really, because worst case scenario, I would get another job. I would raise that money up again. And yeah, maybe I would have lost a year or two, but at least I would have learned a lot. So for me, I think it's just a mindset thing. What, where people see courage or, or bravery, I think, I, I think actually very practically and think actually it's probably not that brave or in a worst case scenario, what is gonna happen? Like me quitting my job, I, I'm, I'm not gonna die. Like there's, there's potential, there's opportunity out there. And for me, I think it's, I'm more fearful of missing out. I'm more fearful of sitting in that nine to five, doing something I'm not passionate about, getting to the end of my life and thinking, wow, I wish I had taken a leap or I, I wish I had given this my all. So I think, I think the fear of that 
for me is greater than the fear of of failing and and that's what drives me and for me i've just learned along the way especially from my first business that nothing shapes you more than a failure like nothing builds you more than failing because i learned so much more from my losses than my wins like i learned so much more from trying to navigate a situation that's difficult than just going through and winning 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 so yeah like i i don't view fear the same way most people typically would and we're just like i think that's powerful by the way thank you and we're just getting to a stage where we're tiptoeing back into somewhat of civilization but many businesses were put on hold um, for the past two years, still on hold because of the coronavirus. How did that impact your business and how did you navigate that, that, that dynamic? Yeah, it, it hit us hard because we had just done back-to-back um, pop-up stores and like we just finished one in Carnaby Street in December 2019. And we were planning to literally open up shop right by that pop-up that we had done Um, because the store did really, really well. And we realized that with the products we sell, a lot of people, if they can get their hands on it, if they can see it in the flesh, then they'll they'll be bought into it. So then, yeah, 2020 hit, the pandemic hit, and we had to pivot. We had to change our approach because opening up a store just didn't make sense. Um, And with everyone being at home, we just, we doubled down on our online business. Um, and last year was our biggest year ever for online sales. So we were able to turn around what was a, a crazy situation. And then instead of um, investing so much into establishing our, establishing our own stores, um, I brought my cousin on board who has like an extensive business development background. And then we, we started exploring um, retail partnerships. And then, yeah, thankfully we were able to secure Nordstrom on the back end of last year. So we're in 30 of their stores um, nationwide in the States. And we're about to be in another large retailer as well that we've just, um, we've just confirmed. I can't announce just yet, um, but that's another big announcement coming soon. So for us in the midst of that hard situation, again, we just looked for opportunity and the opportunity was doubling down online. The opportunity was instead of trying to establish our own retail presence, trying to partner with more established retailers, and America for us is is the next market we really want to try and enter and dominate. And yeah, thankfully we've been able to be in two of their biggest retailers now. Wow, congrats. So like you realized that e-commerce was going to be one of the factors to kind of elevate the business. For sure. And like you say, congratulations, Nordstrom is, is a big deal. Mm-hmm. There's a misconception, however, though, because people looking at the 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 names and the growth can essentially just see it as we've made it, you know, they've made it, you know. What, what do you think the misconception is of this level of expansion and, and how does it impact you as an individual, as the owner of the company and people in that position? Yeah, I, I, I think the misconception is just the level of hustle it takes to get to this point and the level of hustle it takes to even just maintain this point, let alone scale. And for us, like when we got the Nordstrom deal, I was just over the moon. But then two seconds later, I think logistics. All right, how are we actually gonna fund this? How are we gonna get enough stock to them? How are we gonna turn this around in a timely manner? So it it is weird because I feel like I'm not celebrating my wins long enough because instantly I'm just thinking, how does this make logistical sense? How do we, and how do we execute on a level where they would want to reorder and and things are established in a good way. Um, so yeah, that that was a, a, a massive eye-opener for me. And I think a lot of people out there, they probably don't know the day-to-day hustle that it takes. And yeah, like just going back to this whole Nordstrom deal and the other deal that is to come, we've had to now go out and find new funding partners um, thankfully, there's a, a VC firm called Good Soil um, who's, who's been happy to kind of partner with us and be a line of credit f- for, for these deals. But if it wasn't for that, as good and as big as and amazing these deals were, we would have probably crumbled under the deals in trying to fulfill them. Um, 
So yeah, we've got such a long way to go as a business. This is still the super early days. We're far from our made it moment, um, but it, it's encouraging. I think these are just steps towards the vision coming to life. But yeah, we, we're, we're very far from where we want to be for sure. And you recently announced, congratulations on, on, on Twitter, that you hit the million pound mark as a business. Once again, you put it out there. How how do you feel that um, that that number has impacted you and, and and what's changed and how have people changed around you, should I say? What's changed? I, I mean, because a couple of years ago we hit um, a couple million in terms of our valuation, I think people have already had the millionaire perception around the business and myself in a sense. Um, hitting it in revenue is obviously even better. And that's, that's the dream. I think now that we've done the first meal, it's about trying to replicate that again as quick as possible and continually scale. Um, I don't know, I think people maybe perceive that I have a lot more disposable income than I probably do. Um, for me, pretty much every penny that comes in, I'm always just thinking, how can we flip it? How can we get it back into the business to scale our efforts in a, in a productive way? Um, so yeah, there may be, I guess some misconceptions may be around disposable income. Um, and yeah, maybe I think probably some people around me may have more of an entitlement kind of attitude around expectations. Um, but I just try to be honest with my community and network and just let them know where I'm at. Yeah, we've hit a mill, but unless I reinvest every penny we've made back into the business, we'll probably crumble before we hit the next mill. Um, so yeah, that's, I'm always passionate about showing them that this is just a marker. This is where we've come. And, and I shared it with the world just to say that like, it's possible, um, growing up, if I was, if I told my 11 year old self, you're going to be a millionaire by starting a watch company, I would have said like, what? Like it, it would have been ba very baffling to me. So sometimes I do share like our big wins just for the person who's just just literally built their e-commerce website to say, actually, it's possible. Someone who looks like me, maybe from a, a disadvantaged background like myself, has gone on to generate that amount of income and impact that amount of lives, then yeah, maybe I can do the same too. So yeah, that's why I try to be transparent with everything I do. I'm actually building a YouTube channel where I'm gonna be talking a lot around building the business every single element that's contributed towards the business growth so that many, many more people can be enlightened around what goes into building a successful e-commerce business. Have you taken a moment to acknowledge this achievement? And if so, how do you feel about it? Um, it it's a difficult one for me because yes, we've achieved some good things but as again, we're very far from where we want to be. Um, and I feel like a hypocrite because I'm always telling people to celebrate their wins. And, and, and I feel like, I don't know, I celebrate by, I'll just splash on something for myself a bit and be like, yeah, you've just won, you deserve that. Or you know, I'll buy a bit of new tech to, for, towards building the business. So it, <laughs> I don't know, it, it's like, it's celebrating a win, but it's also investing in my future. Um, so yeah, I think I have taken it into, taken it into stock and I'm, I'm grateful that for how far we've come, but I just know there's, yeah, there's a watch business out there that's making a hundred times what I'm making today. Do you know what I mean? And with that in mind, I can't, I can't rest. I can't, I can't pause what I'm doing. I need to just, just push on. Another thing that kind of derived from this lockdown period was the rise of the BLM movement. And you were very vocal about your experience and experience of other people. How do you feel like that, uh, that the rise of the movement has impacted maybe yourself or just the way in, pe the way in which people navigate uh, through the awareness that you interact with? Yeah, I think, I think as tough as last year was and as tough as that season was, I think it was a real beautiful season of, of awakening. Um, I think a lot of people were now put in a position to express how they felt for a very, very long time. 
And I think people were a lot more willing to listen. There were a lot more allies that were ready to kind of rally alongside us and say, wait a minute, maybe enough is enough. And maybe I do have power to make us an impact in, in, in a small way. So for me, yeah, like last year was crazy. It was crazy to think that people didn't realize what we go through on a day to day. Um, it was crazy to think that it took the death of a man um, to bring all of this to the forefront. Um, and yeah, it, it's sad that George Floyd literally had to lose his life before these conversations could occur. Um, but yeah, in the midst of all of that, I would say for the most part, having those conversations has brought about positive fruit. Um, and I think more and more people are committed to make tangible efforts now to, to make a difference. Um, I always say this, but I truly don't believe we will get the equality that we desire in a capitalist structure, in a capitalist world without capital. Like you can, you can do all the protests you want to do, and I'm not against protests, they are important. But yeah, you can do all the protests, you can shout, you can put all the black squares on, on Instagram you want, you can do all of that stuff. But until there's, until there's more capital poured into our, our communities, we won't see the impact and change we want to see. Um, so yeah, I think one of the most beautiful things that's arisen from that season is more people being conscious around actual physical, tangible things they can do to help support the community. I know Nordstrom have actually dedicated to doing over 500 million in sales from black owned or operated businesses. Um, so th there's the potential that we've actually benefited from this whole season and them wanting to work with us as a result of needing to hit that number and, and support more black businesses. So I think for anyone out there, if you are a, a young black person building your business, I think it's good to see this as a, as an opportunity to be very vocal about what you believe in, to be very vocal with what you stand for and to just spot the opportunities to, to expand, especially in the arenas of capital. If there's more black businesses killing it, bringing in revenue, and then we see that there's a need in our community for that youth club or for that one thing that's gonna help support our community, we will then have the income to make the impact. But what, without the income, it is very, very difficult to do that. Mm. William, it's very evident that you've been an individual that's been different and experienced an array of different experiences. When did you realise that you were different? I think, I think boarding school did that for me because, because I was plucked out of an environment where we were all the same in a sense. And I, I, was, I was plucked into this new environment. And I think I realised quite young that I don't really like, I'm, I have a bit of a rebellious streak in me. I don't like following orders. Or if I follow orders, I need to know the logic behind it. You can't just tell me to do something with no, without explaining why or, or the purpose. And again, I think the systems and structures maybe in boarding school opened my eyes to the fact that I didn't like to stay within, within boxes. And I think from a young age, I've had a bit of an attitude where I haven't really cared to be perceived as, as the in-person in a way. And I think when you don't care about being the in-person, you're more likely to become the in-person, if that makes sense. So I've just... I've just always tried to be in my lane, even in, in, in building and creating and designing watches. Um, I've just tried to be in a lane which not many people are in, especially in our background, so that I can carve something unique. I just, I just don't like, I hate wearing what everyone's wearing. If I buy a car and then I see it on, on the street loads, after a while I'm like, I don't want this car anymore. Everyone's got it. I've always just wanted to, to, to bring and birth unique things into the world. Also, just looking at like your journey to, to this far, what do you feel like you want all of the, the work you're doing to kind of represent? I think I, I think I just want it to represent a life without limits. So I grew up in an estate where the media has always told us you're from this background, you have this limit on your life. I've grown up as a young black person we're told we have these limits on our lives. Um, I went to boarding school where 
like people viewed me as less than because of my background, again, limit, they place this limit on my life. And I think everything I do, I want it to scream a life without limits. Like, and I want to, I want, I want that to be passed on to as many people as possible that you can live without limits. It's as simple as that. And we do that in the fact that, yeah, when someone buys a watch, we provide a full set of school uniform or a solar lamp to a child in need so that they can study. Um, so like everything we do is removing limits, um, limits, whether it's the physical ones across sub-Saharan Africa or just the limits of mindset. That's why I share our wins because I just want someone else to see it and say, actually, these limits that we think are real, maybe they, they aren't and maybe we can overcome and maybe we can do beyond what we've been told we can do. Amazing. And you, you seem very vocal to kind of like the next generation, even when you're talking to me here, outside of like the practical element of business and you having, you know, the logical approach to things, what have you done or what do you do? Let's say, what have you done to kind of cultivate your mindset? Because a lot of what you're saying, like you said, it's when like the work meets the moment, you know, like even when you mentioned Nordstrom, like you couldn't have been in a position for Nordstrom if you hadn't done the work. And when you didn't have the, that kind of a deal or you were, going through the motions of like stores, how, 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 how does personal development play a part in your, in your day to day? Um, I'm always just trying to feed myself and, and understand the way I like to be fed, right? Um, if, if you absolutely hate Chinese food and everybody's telling you Chinese food is the only food you should eat and then you, you're trying to force feed yourself that route, like you probably get to a point where you're fed up. You're like, oh, I can't do this anymore. And I think for me, that's the same in maybe education or like read this book and do that. I don't necessarily learn those routes, but audio books for me have been incredible. Podcasts for me have been incredible. And there's a podcast called How We Built This or How I Built This. And I think in the early days of my business, that was instrumental because so many people were just sharing their stories of from zero to 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 hero and how they came from nothing. And I think if you hear that day to day and it reinforces your mindset, you, you get to a point where again, you just feel like the, the limits are fake and you, you can break through those limits. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that's how I feed myself. I try to have positive examples all around me. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be mentored by the likes of Richard Branson. But even aside from that, just Listening to even recently, I, I listened to 50 Cent's latest book. And after you listen to that, you kind of, in a sense, feel like you've been mentored by 50 Cent because you, you've you kind of gauged all their pearls of wisdom. You understand their day to day. So I think in this modern day, you can be mentored by so many people that you've never even met. And I would just encourage people to find out what feeds you. Stop force feeding yourself in a way that yeah, it doesn't feel natural. Find out what you're naturally drawn to and, and feed yourself that way as much as possible. And last but not the least, who is William Adossi? Who is William Adossi? That's a, that's a deep question. I would say William Adossi is a, a dreamer, an innovator, and someone who just makes things happen. Someone who th puts things into action. Um, but yeah, that yeah, that's what that's who I would say I am. It's a very tough question to answer. Um, because yeah, there's obviously many other layers to it. But yeah, that's that's who I am. I'm I'm a dreamer, I'm an innovator, and I always want to level out the parent playing field. Um I really do want to see equality for more people. And I think business is one of the ways we can achieve that. I feel like you're doing your part, and it's like I said from the start, it's inspiring. We love it, we, we like to promote it. And um, thank you for taking the time for today to share your journey with us. Thanks for having me. My bro. Thank you, man.